This is going to be... My hair looks awesome. This is going to be a new feature when we move forwards. The Book at Bedtime phone-in show. I'm going to change the graphics and all of that. Um, th these are the old school graphics, but the Book at Bedtime phone-in show is going to be an exclusive for you Patreon people out there. Um, you will get to watch it live. You get to phone in, same phone number. You will also get to watch it afterwards. And you will uh, get to listen to the audio afterwards. Imagine. So if anyone wants to call in, 0203 286 6370 is the phone number. Welcome to the first. I thought we wouldn't need any mods, but then Gingerbeard Mark comes in. Welcome to the very first ever Book at Bedtime Late Night phone in. And this week, it's Lynn Perry Secrets of the Street. I should warn you, this gets a little bit racist. I will be changing some of the language that is used within this book. But I'm going to read it. You are welcome. You are welcome to call in at any point about the book or about anything you want to call in about. This is entirely up to you. This is kind of an experiment to see if this works, okay? We're not actually streaming this. This is kind of, and we. Um, this may be behind a paywall, this may not. So I'm gonna read, you call in. If I miss your call, I will keep checking on the phones. Um, I will I will get to them whenever whenever I do. Lim Perry's Secrets of the Street, the book they could not ban. Uh, but uh, my life is Ivy Tilsley. I don't know why they'd want to ban it. I can't imagine anyone attempted to ban this book. Um, Yet yeah, they did. Can I ask how did you, uh, so? I, did you get an email saying this was happening? Just find it working out how Twitch works. Did you get any... Why did I have a beard and a moustache for so long? I look great without them. As Scott Balcony said, I look delicious. Uh, Lynn Perry with Charles Yates and Claire Morris wrote. So a lot of people helped write this book. By the way, smash that like button. There's a thumbs up button. Smash it. Smash it. You got an email. You got a Patreon notification. Billy, I want to be friends with you. I want to be friends with you. I want to I wanna hang out with you. Can we be friends and hang out? Can we? Okay, so let's let's do this. This was uh, 1994. Wow, okay. For Stephen and Derek for putting up with me, they've stuck with me through thick and thin, and I've endured all my mood swings. And then there's some quotes. Fame always brings loneliness... Ain't that the truth? Success is as ice cold and lonely as the North Pole. That's from Vicky Baum in Grand Hotel. Fame, like a drunkard, consumes the house of the soul. This is a private URL, so it's just us. It's just us here. That's from Malcolm Lowry of the reception given to Under the Volcano, 1940s. And fame, like a drunkard, consumes the house of the soul. Chapter one, near death and rebirth. Lim Perry, Secrets of the Street. The book they could not ban, my life as Ivy Tilsley. My eyes rolled as I dropped to the floor. I felt nothing as I hit the ground. I could have been dead. Alf Roberts, Jack Duckworth and Kevin Webster shot looks of horrified helplessness around the room as I lay there twitching and gagging for air. Hello, Tony. Jim McDonald sprang into action and rolled me into the recovery position. Now, I wouldn't have put Jim McDonald and Ivy Tilsley in the same era of Coronation Street. That's, that surprises me. I thought there was a, a, a time difference. It could have been a dramatic scene from the top soap, but this wasn't acting. I was dying down there in the restroom at Granada's Studio One where Coronation Street is filmed. The helpless huddle of actors. Now we get their real names. Brian Mosley. You're a big man, but you're out of shape. Bill Tarmy and Michael Lavelle looked on in disbelief as I went through what appeared to be death throes at their feet. 
I was stiff and shuddering. Michael, who plays mechanic Kevin Webster, was staring wide-eyed as I gasped for air. My pal Charlie Lawson, who plays Jim McDonald, leapt to the ground, pushed me onto my side, checked my airway was clear in the mouth. Excuse me! Oh, dear. My hair looks great. Why did I have a beard and a moustache? Look at me. I'm a fine young man. And loosened my clothing. People who witnessed my collapse thought I was a goner. What you'll notice about me is I can read uh, the words, but then I can remember a lot of the words. So I look up and I'm actually saying a lot of the words to the camera, even though I do it now. Cool-headed Charlie played the lifesaver to a T. It's a whole sentence. Somebody called the emergency services and the Granada doctor and nurses were on the scene swiftly. Hardly any of that was done looking at the book. You can actually use this. This will be a podcast that you will get sent to your Patreon and a video. I may This may not be behind a private URL thing when we do it. I don't know. We're going to experiment. But this is, by the by, this is a book. You want to call in, you can call in at any moment. Talk about the book. Anything. It's like a book club. I should call it a book club. It's a book at bedtime. It's better. The speed of all their responses helped save my life. They took me by ambulance. Blue lights flashing, klaxon bearing. I don't think it is a klaxon on, a, on an ambulance. I've, I've asked... Um, I don't think... Catherine is joining us. Well, she might, I don't, she doesn't know I'm doing this. But I just sent her a little message saying, could you check this works? But she's busy with her life. So, sorry, to Hope Hospital in Salford and straight into intensive care. When I eventually came round, I was told by a doctor I was 30 minutes away from meeting my maker. No more than that. They informed me that if I'd been left any longer and survived, I would have had irreparable brain damage. I nearly said irreparable. I remember none of it. The scene I've set out above is a reconstruction of what I'm told happened when I collapsed. Well, all biography and autobiography is a reconstruction. Right. Doesn't it? I was out cold, completely unconscious. There was no warning before my collapse and it left me on another planet for weeks afterwards. Three days earlier, I'd lost four pints of blood in a near fatal accident at home. This sounds silly, but I was perming my hair in the bedroom with the help of my best friend, Sandra Gill, when it happened. My hairdresser refused to do it because he said you should never perm bleached hair. Now I wish I'd listened to him, but I'm very stubborn. And when I get an idea into my head, that is it. When we do this properly, it'll be different graphics. I might even have a green screen behind me. In this instance, I went to Boots the Chemist myself and bought a suitable styling kit. I didn't use perm curlers because I feared if I did, I'd end up with awful Afro-style curls. Pa curls, page two. And it's already uncomfortable in the language. I can see all your comments, by the way. They are welcome. And by the way, we've got 40 people watching. And that's significantly less than we get on Twitch. But it makes me feel it makes me feel better than when we got like 5,000 on Twitch. Because I know you are all wonderful, wonderful patrons. Lynn. Lynn. So she's gone to Boots the Keller. She doesn't want awful Afro style curls. In, hello? Uh, I believe Catherine is here joining us in spirit. Catherine, make yourself known to the chat, please. We are... Book, it's the book club, the Ian and Catherine book club, Lynn Perry, Secrets of the Street. If you want to call in at any time, you're very welcome to, to discuss the book, to discuss books in general, to have a chat, to phone up and say this should be out there for free. You can do whatever you want to do. Why did I have a beard and a moustache for so long? Look at me. I'm adorable. So she's gone to Boots the Chemist and she doesn't want awful Afro style curls. Instead, I used ordinary plastic rollers held in place with hairpins. 
We had almost got the job done in the master bedroom when some of the perming solution went in my eye. I immediately ran into the ensuite bathroom to bathe it. Now, what you can't see there is ensuite is done. Let me show you. This is important. Where in my eye? Uh, ensuite is done in italics. Ensuite is done in italics. Why? Why? Why italics? Oh, it will. Listen, Tony, as we move on, I'm going to change the graphics. It's going to be completely different graphics. So we're going to have a green screen. We'll have candles going. It's going to be great. This is better than Audible. This is better. <clears throat> anyway, let's carry on with this. This is important. Uh, but as I got through the door, I caught my heel on a bath mat and careered headfirst into the tiled wall. Wow. I hit it with an awful thud and one of those hairpins punctured the temporal artery in my head. Does that mean the temporal lobe is like the front, isn't it? So is that something like that? I don't know. I take about 15 tablets to stay alive. <laughs> I take about 15 tablets a day to stay alive because of a history of heart trouble. And some of them are anticoagulants. I'm not sure I believe this story. I wonder if there was any naughtiness going on. Exactly. I look great without a beard and a moustache. What a waste of years. Some of them are anticoagulants. As a result of these drugs, my blood is very thin. That night, I went. I was to see a lot of my watery blood. Well, I don't know. How does this pop up? Do, does this bring, when you, the link I sent you, does this bring you to YouTube or can you watch it within the, the Patreon page? I'd love to know because I don't really know how it works. Uh, the temporal artery is the one that runs in front of the ear where its pulse can be felt and over the scalp. Okay, so I was right. So it's there. It helps supply blood to the temporal lobe in your brain, which is the bit that plays an important part in the storage of memory. Ah, uh -huh. I'd forgotten that. With hindsight, this incident might account for my memory not being all it should. The blood was pumping out of this gash. Come on, guys, at quite a rate. Sandra and I were... Now, this was her friend, Sandra Gill. Sandra and I were mopping the stuff up with, a, with huge pieces of cotton wool. Almost as soon as she put a chunk of cotton wool to my head, I was reaching for the next one as the blood seeped through. We had about... Mm, we had about 10 sodden red pieces in the bathroom bin before Sandra decided to wrap a bath towel round my head to stem the flow. Sandra, who regularly acts as the voice of reason, was suggesting I should go to the hospital. But we were both a little tipsy. <clears throat> and in no fit state to drive. I didn't fancy going to a hospital and the next day finding some story about a street star's home perm horror in the newspapers. When you're in a show like Coronation Street, the media spotlight is tremendous, but you've got to accept it. People in the public eye who get their wages as a result of their popularity have to appreciate media attention goes with the territory. Okay, there's a delay of about 30 seconds and I can tell that by your response to the gash comment. If you click the live button, there should be like it should say live. Click that, and that should bring you up to date. But I don't know. I hate these MPs who hammer on about invasions of privacy when they've been caught getting an extramarital leg over by the press. It smacks of hypocrisy when they've been elected on the family ticket. I could not agree more. But on that Friday night, fourth of June, nineteen ninety-three. Five days before my 20th birthday. Sandra and I weren't having a deeply philosophical conversation about press intrusion. We were simply ho hoping that the bleeding would stop. Now, she, remember, like, she said she's lost four, she loses four pints this night. That's half of your body blood. Does a tiny person have the same amount of blood as a bigger person? And I mean height. I don't necessarily mean weight. Because she's tiny. And I'm big. Would I have the same blood as Lynn Perry? 
I pressed the towel tight to my head for about half an hour. We both thought the flow had ceased when no bled blood spread to the surf outside of the towel. So I carefully unwrapped the turban from my head. As I peeled off the last layer of towel, a gush of fresh blood shot across the bathroom and splattered against the wall. It was like a Steven Spielberg special effect. A cascade of bright red blood hurtling through the air. It was horrific. That's when I knew I needed hospital treatment. Sandra ran for the phone and cracked her foot straight into the end of the bed, breaking one of her toes. She was in I'm going to have to empty you both out. What? I don't know what that means. That's a disgusting phrase. Sandra ran for the phone and cracked her foot straight into the end of the bed, breaking one of her toes. Ouch. She was in agony as she dialed 999. The ambulance men arrived, and it would be men in those days, and I remember drifting in and out of consciousness as we headed for the accident and emergency department. I clearly recall the ambulance man in the back saying to the driver, Charlie, will you put your foot down? She's bleeding like a pig. A quaint turn of phrase, but I was in no position to complain. Thank you, Jimbo. When I got to hospital, they stitched me up and sent me home. Three stitches in the artery stopped the blood pumping out. They didn't ask me how much blood I'd lost and I never told them. I guess they imagined I'd just come straight in. I later discovered that having lost that much blood could have contributed to the imbalance in body salts that led to my studio collapse. They think the lady doth protest too much. Sandra had treatment for her broken toe on the same night and left with two of her little piggies strapped together. Two references of pigs in two paragraphs. The next day was Saturday and I was off work and feeling dizzy. I thought, this thing has knocked me for six, but I went back to work. As soon as Liz Dawn saw me, she said, oh, you don't look well. I told her about the knock on the head and that I didn't feel too good either. The last thing I remember on the Monday was standing at a desk with Charlie sitting in a chair. He told me the next minute I went completely rigid and fell over like a plank. He said that as I was lying there on my back, I started breathing in terrible gasps and twitching. He used his first aid knowledge to make sure my tongue wasn't blocking my throat. By the time I got to hospital, I was completely zonked. Yet apparently, people were visiting me in Hope Hospital and I was talking to them right as rain. I haven't a clue who came to see me. I must appear very ungrateful to those people who did come and those I never thanked afterwards for bringing flowers. But I was going through a very rough time, to put it mildly. I had five major fits and needed three brain scans. But the, having a bra I've had brain scans... Does, that doesn't mean necessarily you're poorly. It means they're trying to find out what's wrong with you. Three lumbar punctures is something. Three brain scans isn't anything. Smash that like button down below, guys. Even though it's um, unlisted, smash it. Christine Watts, one of my friends from behind the scenes at Granada. Oh, we got a phone call. This is our first phone call on the Book at Bedtime phone-in. Hello, caller. Welcome to Book at Bedtime phone-in book club. How can I help you? <clears throat> Hi, Ian. Um, it's covered across great, your storytelling tonight. Thank, thank you. Um, I got a, I think I got a notification. Yes. Uh, <laughs> through, um, yeah, through through the Patreon. I think uh, notifications are on. I'm, I've got an Apple phone, so, yeah, I think that's how it came through on mine. Okay, okay. Uh, um, so that's good. Um and and you know in terms of the actual content yeah. tonight it's it's very horrific bloody <laughs> and uh, quite frankly scary. I should have given a warning that <laughs> this would. I didn't know. I, I'll be honest. I haven't read this book, so I didn't know. But you're right. I sh I need to give a warning that this is um, this is dangerous stuff. There's a lot of blood in there, isn't there? A, a lot, lot of blood. blood. It's a lot of blood. Um, but we like a little bit of blood, don't we? Okay, and um, message oh. for Catherine. I love the uh, thing that she's put the little uns, um, wisdom on the Patreon oh, platform. Oh, yeah. Because um, yeah. I think little un could, you know, could become, you know, like a world leader. Oh, God. She's got a lot of I've wisdom at a young age. I have met her. Um, that would be awful. 
<laughs> that would be bloody awful. Oh, no. <laughs> no, she's good. So we, you're right. You're absolutely right to point that out. We are, because I made the mistake in that people who join from now will get charged and then they don't get charged until July the 1st. I've stopped that, but that's my fault and balls up. So Catherine and I had a mad panic today and we've just, we've put a load of content on there. You've probably all been bombarded with emails and things. It won't always be like that, but we just want to make sure if people do pay to join us, they've got like a backlog, a library, if you will, of stuff to access so that they feel they're getting their money's worth. And I think Catherine putting those up today has certainly um, made it worthwhile for people to, to pay. Absolutely. Thanks, Ian. Thank you, Alistair. Tati, bye. This is... any uh, And thank you for that, uh, Tony. Streaming latency is something you might want to tweak as you're phoning, you'll want it at ultra low. Thank you. I don't think I can change that while I'm streaming. I just had a little look, and I, I think I have to do that before the stream starts. Fine. Let's write that down. Uh, let's rub that out. I don't know what that is. Let's... Where's my, my black marker? Oh my God, now we've turned into a thing. I don't know where my black marker is. We've turned into a thing. We've turned into a thing. This is, this is, your, this is the book of bedtime. Latency. YouTube, there we go. Thank you very much, we'll have a look at that. We'll have a look at that. Hope you've enjoyed the goodies today. We wanna to make, you know, we, our balls, I'm, I was kicking myself that, um, anyway, um, anyway, let's let's carry on because this could take ages. So hoping we could finish it, or at least a chapter tonight. Isn't it nice, no adverts? Um, uh, oh, here we go. He t so he was Jim McDonald, Charlie. He told me the next minute I went completely rigid and fell over like a plank. He said that as I was lying there on my back, I started breathing in terrible gasps and twitching. He used his first aid knowledge, a lot of sentences starting with he there, at least three, to make sure my tongue wasn't blocking my throat. Yeah, Catherine had that black marker. I don't know where she put it. I don't know where she put it. Yeah, but focus. <laughs> By the time I got to hospital, I was completely zonked. Yeah, apparently people were visiting me in Hope Hospital and I was talking to them right as rain. You can cut this bit out because we've done that. Uh, I haven't a clue who came to see me. Five fits and the three brain scans were back. Christine Watts, jeez. We're going to do the same book all the way through, Always New Depths. One of my friends from behind the scenes at Granada came and later told me how I was swearing at the top of my voice on this ward with three other women. I was causing mayhem, effing and blinding like mad. I prefer the phrase effing and jeffing. Hello, Amber. My brother Dougie came to see me. Dougie, that's a great name. I use it for the De Niro mole. You're absolutely right. I did. It doesn't matter. Thank you. I love you. You've been keeping track of my black marker. You can call in anytime you want, by the way. He had me in pleats afterwards when he told me what I was like. I had it in my head when he was there that I needed a golfing cap. I was lying there in the half dead in a hospital bed screaming at him, get my fucking golfing cap. I'm playing in the fucking Caribbean. I was upsetting everybody with my bad language and irrational behavior. In the end, Sandra told Dougie to go away and get my golf cap. He did. But when he came back, I'd forgot all about it. No, thank you, DJ Moon. I said, what have you brought me that for? I'm in hospital. He laughed it off and said, it's a sun helmet in case you get a heat wave on the ward. Fun times. I would go into these awful screaming fits whenever they wheeled me off for a brain scan. I remember nothing about these brainstorms. It was real life or death stuff. In fact, at one time, I thought I had died. Now, this bit I do recall. It was when they transferred me out of Hope Hospital to the private Oakwood Clinic which is also in Salford. I was lying on this trolley being wheeled through all these hospital wards that were filled with flowers. There were bouquets everywhere I looked. News of my collapse had reached the newspapers and because it was so serious, the story was all over the front pages the next day. As a result, all my friends and thousands of fans who adored my screen character Ivy sent cards, get well messages and thousands upon thousands of flowers. I was on my back being wheeled past all these beautiful blooms and I just kept thinking... I'm dead. They're burying me. I'm at my own funeral. It 
it made me think about the only person I know who did go to their own funeral. Stephen Hancock, who played Ernie Bishop in Coronation Street. He hid behind some bushes and watched as Ernie's coffin was filmed after his character had been blasted out of the show by two robbers in a particularly bloodthirsty murder scene. But that's about as close as you get to it, or so I thought until this day. They were wheeling me along and I wasn't there. It was like I was watching a film. Apparently, somewhere along this journey through the corridors at Hope Hospital, I did go unconscious. So whether I was dreaming or not, I just don't know. At the time, it all felt very real. They call it an out-of-body experience. It was very eerie. I've got a great voice. I'm listening to this and thinking, my voice is great. I should be doing this stuff for... Um, now, it was very eerie. I've had some incredible experiences in my life, as you'll find out. But this was the most extraordinary ever. When I got to Oakwood, I was still in an awful, awfully muddled state and just as awkward with the people around me. I started off yelling at Sandra, Why are you here? You should go home. I don't want you here. She had been my best friend for years and I was treating her abysmally. Then, as she was about to depart, I insisted that she stay. She didn't know if she was coming or going, but she stayed by my side at all times after I'd asked her. Granada TV were picking up the bill for my treatment and they paid for Sandra to stay in a bed in my room. She was with me in that room for about a week. I couldn't bear to be without her. She's a real angel, but she told me later that she thought I was heading for the pearly gates on more than one occasion during those nightmare days. For years I've been living a sad and lonely life. Well, it got so much worse when I found out my only son, Stephen, was suffering with HIV, as I'll share with you later. We've had two throw forwards. So you, if you're reading this going, it's a bit boring. Oh, she's going to talk to us uh, about AIDS a bit later. It's worth sticking around for. Ever since then, I've been walking around with the dead weight in my stomach. That's right. It's about you. Something inside me that was dragging me down. I spent a lot of my time getting drunk, trying to blot out the pain of thinking about Stephen. I also drank to help me cope with my loneliness. My husband, Derek, spent most of his time in our bungalow in Maltby, South Yorkshire, 70 miles away from my Salford home. But after coming so close to death, I changed as a person. People, smash that like button, by the way, guys. Let's smash that like button. People who survive in situations on the brink of life and death often have a changed perspective of what it's all about. And that's precisely what happened to me. The doctors telling me to quit boozing or die also helped my resolution to live a different life. Before that near fatal collapse in the studios, I'd been sliding from one tremendous boozing session to the next, drinking myself into oblivion on brandy and baby sham or whatever else I fancied. I called my time at Granada my lost 23 years because my existence revolved around drinking. Please be quiet, big boy. I used to I, I used to have a saying that God takes the good ones first, so I'll probably still be living when I'm 187. Spoiler alert, she's not. I've been a hell of a sinner, but God must have forgiven me many times. Just like my street character, I was brought up a Catholic. Although when I played pious poison ivy on the screen, my real life could not have been further removed from hers. I was partying and screwing around like there was no tomorrow at one stage, but now it's firmly in my past. Coming so close to meeting my maker has helped me come to terms with myself. I probably lost a bit of my ambition at the same time. Things happened to me on set after that collapse that I'd never have let anyone get away with before. Poison Ivy was losing her bite and I wasn't fighting for her. One time, I'd have gone hell for leather to keep Ivy's behaviour in character, but I reached a point where I didn't care. I knew there were more important things in life, good health being one of them. After my release from Oakwood, I had gone home to convalesce. Derek, my dear, long-suffering husband, had been by my side through the very dark days in hospital. Whenever I've needed... Is this interesting? I mean, is this worth doing? There's 44 of you watching. I'd listen to this. Just stop watching the VOD as soon as I... Added to your TikTok. Oh, you've added to the TikTok? Okay, we'll have a little look at that. I don't know how I'd find it. 
Don't know how I'd find it. Don't know where that would be. If you've got a link, then please, please share. Because I don't know what I'd, I don't really understand my way around TikTok. Whenever I leave, but we've always fought like cats and dogs. Our relationship is bizarre, but we are happy with it the way it is. We've been through hell and high water together and we're still stuck with each other. So there must be a bit of love on both sides. Although down the years, I've had my doubts, as I'll explain. During my hedonistic years, and there have been plenty of them, I never considered anything I was doing was wrong. I think that's why I became very cold towards Derek and very cocky. I used to be my own boss. I was able to pay for everything I needed. I never had to think about him. After I was ill, I realized that I couldn't look back and alter the things that had happened. You can have regrets, but you're much better getting on with life and changing the things you can. Three or four years earlier, probably even the day before I collapsed at the studios, I wouldn't have thought like this. I'd be looking back and thinking, oh God, this and if only that. <laughs> I don't do that now. I'm much more positive in my outlook. It certainly helped me sever my links with Granada. If it had happened 12 months earlier, I would have been in pieces, totally shattered by the news. But on the 7th of March, 1994, a much stronger woman walked into the producer's office. I'll tell you that story in full later, too. Before the drama of June 1996, this is a book worth reading. You can call in. I, I, it's, I know it's a weird one. I know there aren't many of us, but um, you're very welcome to call in and chat about the book or anything. I don't, you know. But who, who knows? Before the drama of June 1993, I'd never thought of, I'd never dreamt of doing an autobiography. I always thought dreamt, had dreamt, dreamt, dream PT, dreamt. It's only recently I found out there's no P. And dreamed also works as well, I think. I'd never dreamt, dreamt of doing an autobiography. My life was something I was very confused about. I'll tell you the truth as I know it, and you, the reader, can make up your mind. It's been a damn good life for me. Might not measure up in other people's eyes. I know, excuse me, I know Ivy would be horrified if she knew half of what I've done. But she's gone out of my life now, so I can tell the story without shocking that old friend at least. When I eventually got back to work, I made a major gaffe. I wanted to thank Charlie Lawson for saving my life and helping me through my darkest moments. Instead, I upset him enormously with a flippant remark about his friendship with a pretty assistant stage manager. That's a big faux pas. That's the kind of stuff I would do. I'd heard newspapers were making inquiries about his private life and thought he'd just laugh it off. After all, he was happily married with a lovely wife and child. He didn't see the funny side. He was furious. He blew his top at me and demanded to know who told me. But my mind was so shot, I didn't know. I hadn't any idea what was happening for weeks after I came out of hospital. At first, I didn't even recognise my own house or the gardeners working on my lawn. I had no idea where I was. Charlie accused me of being the one who was spreading gossip about him. I couldn't believe it. I'd been off for eight weeks, two of them in hospital and the other six in a daze at home. It's Jim McDonald. Yes, yeah, Jim McDonald. The only person from the studio I could remember talking to was Jeff Hinsliff, who played my husband, Don. I remember, I remember her first husband. Did she have a second husband? I said I guessed he must have told me about it, but Jeff denied it was him. Well, he who denied it supplied it. Right? I told Charlie not to be such a daft bat, but he was raging. I said, if it wasn't Jeff, I don't know who the hell it was, because I've not spoken to anyone else in the street since I changed my telephone number. After that, he was very distant with me. My big mouth lost me a good friend. It happens to me all the time. Yet after Granada told me they weren't going to renew my contract, Sandra bumped into Charlie in a news agents. He came up to her and said, Tell Lynn, to be sure, I'm really sorry. I really miss her, to be sure. What does he say? What was his... It's like, to be sure. That wasn't... What was it? What was it? To be, to be sure. Was that his catchphrase? Tell Lynn I'm really sorry to be sure I miss her. We've had our ups and downs, but just to ups and downs, but just tell her I'm still thinking about her and I'm sorry that things have really happened the way they have, to be sure. 
Now, I thought that was really sweet of him. I hope if he reads this, he'll realize I'd never have said what I said if I'd known it would upset him so. But I'm rushing ahead. Before I tell you any more, I should start at the beginning. In the actual news agents, not the, not the cabin. That's where we're going to end it. That's part chapter one, part one of Lynn Perry's Secrets from the Street, the book they tried to ban. I think we've got a caller. Hello, Paul. Nope, we lost Paul. Paul's internet is shonky. Let me give Paul a little call back. Just realise, of course, that Paul is um, from Ireland. Let's try that. Hello, Paul. Paul? Not today, Paul. Lovely Paul. Not today. Um, sorry, Paul. You can try try again. But um, it doesn't look like it's working today. So that's the, that for today. This is kind of a little test to just test how streaming. Uh, this uh, <laughs> always new that says, "I'll be honest, this story is very arousing." This is just a little test for me to see how easy it is to stream on YouTube. It turns out it's very easy, and to make it so it's kind of private. The book at bedtime will probably be a public stream when we do it. When we move on from July the 1st. But for the moment, I, or I might try it on Twitch next time. I'll certainly keep in mind that thing about latency. So thank you for that suggestion, Tony. Um, this will be uh, tightened up a little bit and made into a little podcast that you can get. If you haven't already, you've all been sent or you should all have access to an RSS feed. If you put that into your podcast catcher, should then feed the podcast. There's going to be there's going to be quite a few, and I hope it's not too many. If it's too, too many, let us know, and it will depend on what level you're at as to what podcasts you get. I'm going to put this in the 4.99 and up, just so that everyone can see what is available. Um, but at some point, I, the, the 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 video I think will be available to everyone. The live stream in my head will be available for everyone to watch. Um, thank you, Lenny. The live stream will be available for everyone to watch live. I'll email everyone. Then the audio. I think I put 20 pounds. And the video. Six. I don't know. I have to think about it. I don't know anything about this kind of stuff. Um, Jim, I'd love your, your input. That was great. I enjoyed that. I, that was great. I was just reading Adam saying it was great. I don't know. I really enjoyed that. Thank you for coming along. I hope you enjoyed it. Please spread the word. We are nowhere near. We're at 438, which is amazing. But we are nowhere near where we need to be to make this a viable thing. And, and, and both Catherine and I kind of had a big, big old wobble today. Big old wobble today. Um, it's a little bit scary. Uh, but Sai says, I doubt it'll ever be too many. All sorts of content coming out at the moment, so a bit of something to interest interest everyone. Thank you. That's what we hope, Sai. That's what we hope, that that, that you will like some of it. Some of it will go up in different tiers. So at the moment, I've kind of been spamming a lot of it to everybody, but some of it will go up in tiers. Thank you so much for watching. Now, if I... Um, I don't know how to do this, so I think if I stop streaming... This may be a clunky ending. I'm going to stop streaming on OBS, and then I think I stop streaming... Maybe I stop streaming here. Cancel. End stream. Thank you. Goodbye.